Are you in the market for a GPU and don't want to spend more than 250 to 300 bucks? If the answer is yes, then you may be interested in one of these, an RX 5600 XT. And I wanted to look at this card because on paper it's very similar to an RX 5700. Indeed, the primary difference between this GPU and a 5700 is the fact that it has a narrower bus and 2 gigabytes less memory, but it's also considerably cheaper. Entry-level cards for both the 5600 and the 5700 are around 100 bucks uh, apart, which is, well, let's face it, no small chunk of change. This particular card is provided to me by MSI. It's the Gaming X variant, and it is slightly more expensive as it's a premium AIB model. Um, and, of course, this card will be gone, uh, going back excuse me, to MSI after the review is done, and, as always, all opinions are my own. I wanted to look at the 5600 XT purely to answer how it compares against the 5700, so should you spend the extra money for the extra couple of gigabytes of RAM and slightly wider bus, and also, how does it compare against a card such as the 2060 Super, which is, again, slightly more expensive even than the 5700. Furthermore, I've decided to make this review a little different. I'm testing it on a 10900K, which is the system behind me, and also I've decided to run some of these benchmarks on a Ryzen 3300X that was provided to me by AMD, along with uh, this B550 motherboard, which again was from MSI. The reason I wanted to run it with the 3300 as well is because I'm doing a full review of the 3300 and I was like, well, a lot of people who are buying a card like this, they may have a CPU like an older Haswell processor or maybe a Skylake processor. And I think, honestly, a 5600 XT is about the most you would want to pair with one of those uh, CPUs. It's not like, you know, you want to pair like a 2080 Ti with a 3300X, right? Although, um, that's what I did do, of course, for the review, which, again, will be coming up pretty soon. And, yeah, so, without further ado, let's have a look at the aesthetics and uh, I.O. of this card, and then, well, we can go from there. Aesthetics of computer components are definitely very subjective, but to me, the RX 5600 XT Gaming X subjectively, is an attractive-looking card. The basic shroud forming the cooler is neutral enough to avoid clashing with most case colour schemes, and the hints of colour don't come off as tacky or garish. For rear I.O., there's a single HDMI port and three display ports, pretty standard for most AMD or NVIDIA GPUs. The MSI Gaming X RX 5600 XT demands two 8-pin power connectors are sacrificed, and on the front of the card, there are two Torx fans, 100mm, if that's your thing and you want to know. Uh, I can't imagine why you would want to know this. After all, you're only watching the review. Which MSI claims will reduce the noise of the GPU when the fans are up to speed. Honestly, I can largely get behind this claim. With the case open during normal gameplay, you can't really hear the fans at all with semi-decent pair of headphones on. And even without headphones and just listening to speakers, the default fan profile is not, noise in, uh, not noisy or intruding. The fans also don't kick in with the GPU under lower usage, such as light gaming or watching a movie, being on desktop. And default, it won't start until it hits 60 degrees. Once again, this is not an uncommon piece of technology for a modern GPU, but still, it's nice to see it. There are five heat pipes, which are 6mm running through the beefy cooler, and there's a six heat pipe, which is slightly beefier at 8mm. If I were to pick one fault with the card, the shroud doesn't extend all the way to the outputs of the GPU and push the heat out of the uh, rear of the case. As personally, just the way that I set my system up, this is better for my personal airflow. But also, and it's a small nitpick, it kind of bugs me aesthetically as well. I'd also like to point out that this is not a small card. It's almost 30 centimeters long, 297 mm squared. So if you do have a smaller build slash cramped case, well, please make sure you measure first. 
In terms of specifications, the 5600 XT is ultimately very close to the 5700. In fact, it's still using the Narve 10 die. The primary differing factor is the memory. It's still using the Narve 10 die, but once again, equipped with just 6 gigabytes of memory and 192 bit bus rather than 256. Now, there was some, let's say, confusion regarding the memory configuration because AMD basically last minute bumped the specs that the clock frequency of the RAM runs at. It was originally intended to run at just 12 Gbps, which is a cut from the 14 of the 5700, but due to uh, new cards from NVIDIA and uh, NVIDIA uh, adjusting prices, uh, AMD were forced to tweak this to 14 Gbps. So, um, that means that this card performs really close, as we'll see as we're going into the performance, to the 5700. But, of course, there is the additional memory, the extra 2 gigabytes, that the 5700 sports as an advantage. MSI claims the boost frequency for the 5600 XT is 1750, and the game clock is just 1615. As a reminder, the game clock is the speed that the card is expected to hover at during running, well, a game. From my own testing, though, I can say that 1615 seems to be very conservative. We regularly saw 1700 MHz or above during uh, loops of Metro Exodus and also GTA. There's also 36 compute units, which is, well, the same as the 5700 vanilla. And as I've alluded to multiple times now, the primary difference between the 5700 and the 5600 XT is the cut in memory bandwidth. And here we are running 192-bit bus, 6 gigabytes total, um, compared to 14 GPPS um, on a 256-bit bus for 8 gigabytes total. Because of this, um, AMD originally had intended to launch these cards with just 12 GBPS memory, but given it was updated to 14 GBPS, certain cards were shipped at 12. MSI's Gaming X has actually a BIOS on their website which allows you to update the card to 14 GBPS, and this is within Windows using the company's Dragon Center software. They've got a full guide on how to do this, and the card that I received has memory clocked at 14. Performance loss for slower memory speeds, well, it's between 5 and 7%. So, if possible, you definitely want to flash your uh, particular GPU to the faster memory, no matter what the vendor is that you bought it from. My review sample has come with the faster clocks, and MSI seems to be pushing that, so that's how I'll be testing this particular GPU with 14 GPPS memory. AMD's driver experience is definitely a lot friendlier now. The GUI is easier to navigate, provides fantastic features such as in-game performance metrics, access to tuning features such as Radeon Chill and Anti-Lag, as well as features such as recording and live streaming options. Further, there's even basic video editing ability too. It's not going to replace Adobe Premiere by any stretch of the imagination, but you can do basic stuff like cut and trim the length of recorded clips and even export them as short GIFs if you so desire. Honestly, if you're used to NVIDIA's drivers and worried about the switch in terms of user interface, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with how simple and tweakable AMD have made the later Radeon drivers. I don't think anyone is going to buy one of these cards for the purposes of 4K gaming with the latest AAA titles. To this end, I am focusing our testing at 1080 and 1440p. I mean, technically you could run games at 4K, but you would need to cut down quality settings quite considerably in more demanding games, such as, let's say, Metro Exodus, or even slightly older games like uh, Witcher 3 or Shadow of the Tomb Raider, to be able to really crank out high or at least playable frame rates at 4K. I'm also, as I mentioned earlier, testing at uh, two different uh, systems, both the 10900 and the 3300X. We're going to be running a configuration with Intel overclocked to 5.2 gigahertz for all of the cores with 32 gigabytes of DDR4 memory. 
which is uh, paired with NVMe drives from both Samsung and Crucial. I'd also like to thank DeepCool for providing the AIO for the CPU, as well as the 850 watt PSU and the case we're using too. The second system is a B550 Mortar motherboard from MSI with a 3300X plonked in. The 3300X is a great budget CPU, putting out roughly the same performance as the i7-7700K. We'll go further into the 3300 in a separate video. Giving you a great indicator of what type of upgrades you would get from an older uh, system if you're buying a new GPU. Unfortunately, I didn't get as much time as I'd like with the 3300X as it was on loan from AMD and the majority of my time was testing CPU benchmarks and also raw performance of the 2080 Ti. But I wanted to really put in some of these results simply for the sake of completeness. Starting out with Gears Tactics, this game is, well, taxing. This is particularly true if you enable features such as planar reflections. This title also sports a particularly interesting implementation of VRS, Variable Rate Shading. I've gone into this more extensively in a separate video. Unfortunately though, the first gen of RDNA doesn't support this, but it still performs fairly admirably on the 5600XT. And you can see a similar trend for Gears 5 too. The 5700 does lead over the 5600XT, but I wouldn't exactly call it a commanding lead. As we go through other games such as GTA 5, which is still rather punishing even today despite it being fairly old, you can see that the 5700 remains in the lead, but not exactly by a huge margin. The 2060 Super is generally faster out of all of these cards, although honestly the real win isn't the performance over the 5700, but features such as variable rate shading, gear SS2 and hardware based ray tracing. As for the 3300X, well, yeah, the CPU does great for pushing frames out for the 5600XT. Personally, I think the 5600XT or maybe a 2060 Super is about the most you would want to pair with the 3300X, and certainly in more CPU bound titles, the 3300X will start to fall further behind something like a 3600. So overall thoughts then for the 5600XT, well you can see very clearly why AMD were originally planning to launch this GPU with the slower memory speeds. Despite the cut in the bus width, this card mostly performs within about 10% depending on the title uh, to the um, 5700. Now, of course, you can get closer if you overclock either the memory or, better still, both the memory and the core, which is what we've done um, with our testing. And ultimately, in those cases, you're really within spitting distance of the 5700 vanilla. The primary concern, though, is that this GPU does have 2 gigabytes fewer RAM, which is not a huge amount, theoretically. But if you're running out of VRAM, 2GB can be all the difference in the world. And it may mean in the future that you're going to need to crank down, let's say, texture quality settings, despite the fact that performance is very close to the 5700, simply because you run out of VRAM. Now, it's very difficult to know how games will evolve over the next few years, but it wouldn't surprise me if, given what we're seeing with the PS5 and Xbox, that those two gigabytes are precious. And we've seen situations like this in the past with, let's say, the 780 Ti um, being noticeably more stuttery now, I suppose is the best way of putting it, compared to, let's say, a, 20, a 290X. Uh, despite the fact that the 780 Ti does have more horsepower, it's actually the... 290X which performs generally better because of the extra VRAM. With that said, when you're looking at basic um, models of this card, you're, well, as I mentioned, almost looking at around 100 US dollars in some cases between the two uh, GPUs, which is not a small amount. And you could argue, well, by the time the extra two gigabytes of memory becomes relevant in the vast majority of games, 
The card's going to be too old, really, to fully take advantage of it. There are some games now, though, which do push VRAM. For example, Horizon Zero Dawn with higher quality settings, and even slightly older titles like GTA, when things get really hectic, do quite like numbing uh, VRAM. This is a decision that ultimately you will need to make. Personally, if it were my money, I'd be kind of tempted just to save the cash and go from there. And what about MSI's Gaming X RX 5600 XT? The Gaming X GPU is 30 to 40 US dollar or Great British Pounds, more expensive than a standard reference design. But of course you do get those higher core clocks. Ultimately, it depends upon what you want out of a GPU. If you're willing to go with perhaps slightly lower clock frequencies or maybe a slightly louder design, then of course picking up a, a cheaper model is definitely a good option. But if you want guaranteed higher performance out of the gate, then obviously going with a custom card is the way to go. Naturally, you can overclock a reference design though, but whether you should go with a custom card or whether you should go with a basic reference design, that is totally down to you. With all of that said though, hopefully you found the video informative and helpful. Normal stuff if you did, like, share, comment and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.